Well, good morning, church. Having, uh, as Sam so eloquently calls it, the spin cycle. Coming out of the, the baptistry and doing that spin cycle, Jaron will be in a few minutes, still getting ready there. And uh, I saw out of the corner of my eye, where has he wandered off to? Dylan. Little one here? Yeah. Is he? Yeah. Ah. So everybody's all into, everybody's waiting for me to be done now because first time he's been here. So. Uh, anyway, so as we pick up this week, church, uh, turn with me to Ruth, chapter 3 is where we're going to pick up, and uh, if you were here last week as we went through chapter 2, uh, we got to this meeting of Ruth and Boaz, and what happened there, how, how uh, when, Naomi, or when Ruth went out into the field, and then Boaz shows up and sort of has his moment of, uh, hey girl, like he noticed her, and noticed who she was, and you know, and for those of you that haven't been here before, I'm, I'm a different animal, so just don't hold that against me, but... Boaz had his moment where he sort of saw her in the field and, and she got his attention. And then, as we said last week, Boaz went strong to the hoop with his affection, showing his affection towards Ruth, right? He not only brought her or told her to stay in his field, but he went from just letting her be in the corners or the sides, which he was supposed to let her do. And then he pulled her alongside and said, no, just follow my young women, right? Just go where they go and you'll get the best, you get what they get and they'll be okay. And then he went even farther and said, no, come sit with me and eat at my table. Not only eat at my table, but sit next to me. And he served her directly. And then he went even farther and told his men, hey, just pull some good stuff out of the bundles that you've made and just leave it on the ground for her, right? So he, he really, if he was going to show off for her, he'd pretty much done it. He'd given her about as much leeway as he could without basically saying, hey, why don't you just own the farm? Like, why don't you just take the whole property? Like, that's about as far as he could go. And we get to what we see here in three, because not only did he do that, but uh, he gave her the leftovers from the meal to take back to her mother-in-law and for her. And at the end of the day, she had gotten 26 quarts of barley, which we talked about last week. Uh, one quart was about enough for one person for a day. So she takes home 13 days worth of food for her and her mother-in-law, plus the leftovers from the meal. When in history, what we would learn is that when you would go and try to glean from others' fields, when you would go and have to live off of their sort of, of help, you were lucky to get enough to eat for a day. And so when she comes home with what looks to be about two weeks worth of food, uh, something has happened, right? And Naomi asks Ruth at the end of last week, where did you go? And, and when Ruth says, I went to Boaz, Ruth or Naomi has this moment of, okay. Right? She knows what's going to happen because as we talked about last week, Boaz was what we call a goel or a kinsman redeemer to the family of Ruth and Naomi. It was his job. It was his responsibility to take care of that family. He was the one responsible for her. And so we get to this chapter three. If we talked last week was Boaz sort of shooting his shot at Ruth and seeing what was going to come back. When we get to this week, it's Ruth's turn, right? Ruth is going to show uh, how she feels and sort of show, show what she thinks in this. And uh, so if you remember last week's analogy, we talked about uh, Boaz going strong to the hoop or the analogy of the pickup truck, right? The couples, when they first start dating and you see them in the old single cab pickup truck with that bench seat, right? When they first start dating, where are they at? And they're right next to each other, right? She, he or she, depending on who's driving, the other person has slid all the way down that bench seat sitting next to them, and they're just as close as they can get, right? And then over time, what happens? A little farther away, a little farther away, a little farther away, right? Sometimes. Now in new trucks, right, they have the console in the middle, so you can't even get across to each other. Uh, but so this is the early part of the relationship for them. This is the, the beginning phases, phases, the infatuation phases. And so most of you or any of us know that in the beginning of a relationship, there's a lot of chemicals floating around, isn't there? There's a lot of emotion floating around in there because, you know, you have the butterflies and you have all of those things that happen at the early stages of a relationship. And so that's where we're at in these moments. It's in those, you know, you're just, she's just wanting to hear his voice or she's wanting to hear uh, his voice. It's just in those sort of what we would call Disney-esque moments, right? The birds are singing in just the right, right words and, and everything just looks perfect. The sun shines brighter in the sky, right? This is when you hear the, the kids in school, right? Middle schoolers and high schoolers. Nobody's ever loved like us because it's just so strong. And don't you slow down there, sucker, right? And we had a kid one time, and, and I've seen this as a meme before where kids, young kids will say, you know, they compare themselves to Romeo and Juliet, right? We're so in love. We're like Romeo and Juliet. You have to remind them that lasted three days and killed four people. So <laughs> calm down before you start comparing yourself to these Shakespearean characters, okay? 
So we get here to the beginning of chapter 3 and we see what's going on. Ruth's appeal to Boaz, starting with verse 1, says this. Ruth's mother-in-law Naomi said to her, My daughter, shouldn't I find security for you so that you will be taken care of? Now isn't Boaz our relative? Haven't you been working with his young women? This evening he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfumed oil, wear your best clothes, go down to the threshing floor, but don't let the man know that you're there until he's finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, notice the place where he's lying. Go in, uncover his feet, and lie down. Then he will explain to you what you should do. Now, for us today, as we look at this in, in 2020, we would see that and sort of, we get the idea of wash, put on nice clothes, your perfume, you know, get prettied up, right? Whenever you're going on sort of that first or second date, you try to put your best foot forward, right? Uh, guys, I can speak to the guys in here, because that's what I am. You know, when you're going on that first or second date, you're not wearing the old ratty shorts and t-shirt, right? What are you doing? You know, you're at least getting the nice jeans out. You know, you're thinking, you know, you might go wash the truck or the car even, right? Get wash on it, clean it out a little bit. You're trying to put forth that best effort. Now, girls, sort of the same thing, right? When you're going on that first and second date, you're not just showing up in sweatpants. Maybe you are. Maybe that's what you're doing. But for the most part, you sort of put in some effort, right? I know my wife even today, when we go on, when we have the occasional date night, uh, she still tries to go all out. You know, for me on the other hand, I'm like, well, these shorts aren't too dirty. <laughs> She's in there spending time getting ready, and I'm like, I've got clothes on. We're fine. I'm like, it's fine. So she's putting in some effort here. The next part of this, though, is where we look at this in 2020 and go, wait a minute. This part I don't get, right? Go to the threshing floor, lay at his, uncover his feet, and lie down. Then he will explain what you should do. This is where we go, and we have to look at the history of the time. And this is what you would do if you were going to get the favor of the Goel. That's what you would do to go to the kinsman redeemer. You would lay at the feet and you would uncover their feet. And then if they were going to take the redeemership, they would take their blanket, their cloak, and they would cover you with it. It's a symbol of taking protection and covering someone. It's basically you saying, I will do what you're asking me to do. I will protect you. I will take care of you. And so when we... See this, this isn't some sort of like, you know, what some people would say, oh, well, it, making the woman lay at his feet. No, that's not what this is. This is a symbol. This is her coming and asking for this protection from him and hoping that he will reciprocate. And so we get into five and it says this. So Ruth said to her, I will do everything you say. She went to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law had instructed her. After Boaz ate, drank, and was in good spirits, he went to lie down at the end of the pile of barley. Now, this wasn't uncommon back then as we stop here in 2020. Uh, and this wasn't uncommon back then. If you were a farmer back then, if you had these fields of barley or wheat or different grains, you would pull your harvest in and then you would stay with that harvest as it was at the thresher. You would make sure it was taken care of. You would keep a count on it. You would stay there with it. You know, some of you have been in jobs where that has to happen. You have to stay on the property the whole time, right? When we lived in Houston, when Hurricane Ike came through Houston, those of us, those that were in our church that worked in the plants, the Exxon plants, the Shell plants, the, the natural gas plants down there, uh, when Ike was coming in, they were told they had to stay on the property for the entire time of the storm and afterwards. They lived on the property because of that. Some of you have been in certain jobs like that where you just have to spend your whole time there. That's what's going on here. So he's staying here throughout the, the pulling in of his harvest. So it says, then she went in secretly, uncovered his feet, and laid down. At midnight, Boaz was startled, turned over, and there was at his feet a woman. And so he asked, who are you? Uh, it, which is not surprising, right? Some of, sometimes we read this and we're like, well, why is he so shocked? You imagine this in your house, right? How many of you in the middle of the night at midnight hear a noise and you're just like, yeah, that's normal? Anybody? No. How many of you hear a noise randomly in your house at midnight and you're out of bed and whatever you sleep in and whatever weapon is closest at hand, right? Yeah, show of hands, that's you. Yeah, the rest of you were lying. Right. Some of you may do the old school thing, right? Throw the blankets over your head and you're like, as long as I have my blankie, no one can get me. Right? There's magic powers in the blankie. As long as your feet are covered. So he's surprised by what she's doing, but what she's doing here is she's showing that she wants him to redeem her. He's show, she's showing here that she cares. She's going strong to the hoop, as we would say, as Boaz did last week. This is Ruth coming and showing what she's offering or asking for. And so we think about this in comparison to today, and what does that mean? Well, what does that mean for us, right? Because obviously we're not Ruth, we're not in this situation of needing a, a, a redeemer like she is, but we are in the situation of needing a redeemer of Jesus. 
And in our humanity, what can we do in the, in the midst of Jesus' power, in the midst of Jesus' splendor and holiness? We're not worthy enough to come to him face to face. If Jesus was to come in this room, if Jesus was to descend down and, and enter into our church right now, we'd all hit our face. We'd be stumbling over ourselves to fall down and, and lay down at the awesomeness of Jesus. As much as we would want to think that we, we'd be able to stand or run and hug him, the truth is, as we see it clear in Scripture, that when God shows up, people hit the floor. Right? Even with the angels. When we look at the angels' appearance in Scripture, the two most common Word, the two most common phrases after angels show up, don't be afraid and get up because people hit the floor. When impressed upon by the power of God, we in our humanity will hit the floor every time. We will lay down at the feet of Jesus. Asking for his protection. In the same way we see what Jesus did in, at the end of his earthly ministry... Uh, when he was eating and drinking with the disciples in the upper room. And what did he do? He washed their feet. Preparing them for the journey that was coming. So there's symbolism here, right? There's something going on here a little deeper than, than we tend to put on it sometimes. Because we, in our society today, we sort of think about feet and we're like, eh, no, thank you. Right? Like, no, I'm good, right? Having done sports medicine for a bunch of years, my wife can tell you, I'm over it, right? Like, I don't want anything to do with feet. I'm, I've taken enough ankles. I've worked enough athletes, all those things. I don't want any more of it. You can, I love you. Just don't ask me to mess with your feet, okay? It's just not my thing. But there's symbolism in what's going on here in the understanding being. You think about how important they are, how important the feet are. Right? We can deal with losing a lot. You lose our, we lose our feet. Life is different. And so there's a lot going on here, and we have to see what's happening, what Ruth is doing. And so when he asks, who are you? She says, I'm Ruth, your slave. She replied, spread your cloak over me, for you are a family redeemer. And then he said, may the Lord bless you, my daughter. You have shown more kindness now than before, because you have not pursued younger men, whether rich or poor. Now don't be afraid, my daughter. I will do whatever you say, since all the people in my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Yes, it is true that I am a family redeemer, but there is a redeemer closer than I. Now, you remember what we talked about last week, right? There were two reasons that Boaz just didn't come full out and make his intentions known last week. One was he wanted to make sure that he wasn't forcing anything upon Ruth. And I said we would get to the other one this week. I was suckering it back in last week to come back. And this is the second one, that he wasn't actually the closest in line. Because the way the Redeemer, family Redeemer, the way the Goel worked is it was by how close in, in genealogy you were to the family. And in this family... Boaz is not the closest in relationship to Ruth and Naomi. There's one closer. So he has to default to him. And so he has to go and plead a case to this other redeemer, which we're going to talk about next week. See what I did there? Sucker need back in again. He's going to have to go and go to this redeemer and get him to release his responsibility so that Boaz can pick it up, pick it up which is what he wants. But we see what Boaz does here after this to show how serious he is about it. Because he says in 13, he says, stay here tonight and in the morning, if he wants to redeem you, that's good. Let him redeem you. But if he doesn't want to redeem you, as the Lord lives, I will. Now lie down until morning. Now we pause here for a minute and we think about this, that in our society today, we would see that and sort of go, this doesn't look right. right? This just looks funny, staying together all night, just to... Doesn't lead to good things, right? The truth of this is, is Boaz is already doing what he's called to do as a redeemer. Because he realizes that sending her out after midnight to walk back to where Naomi would be living, which as a single woman, it's dangerous for her. And he's not going to send her out into the night to walk back to wherever Naomi, Naomi's living and risk her getting in danger, risk her getting hurt. He also understands that while it may not look right if this was happening at his house, he understands that they're at the threshing floor. And they're not the only people there, probably. Yes, he's staying with his, his grain, but there are others that are going to be around here, so there's other eyes on them. So there's nothing unkempt, there's nothing out of the sorts of what's going on here. What he's doing is he's protecting her. He's already living up to his responsibility as the Redeemer. He's living up to his responsibility in loving her by protecting her. 
And you think about that for us today, two ways. Number one, as a husband, there are times where my wife will say something to me about, hey, I need to go here or there. And there are certain areas that I'm like, mm, no, I'll take care of it. There are certain times where she says, you know, hey, I need to run to Target to get something. And granted, I know most of you ladies here at Target, and some of you guys here at Target, you just light up, right? Because like, they should change the name of that place to just spend 100 bucks. Because that's what Target is. But there are moments where, where Courtney will say to me, hey, I need to run here and get this, where humanistically I'm like, man, I don't want to leave. I don't want to go out. I don't want to do these things. But I also don't want her going there by herself. Not because she's going to the shadiest parts of town and I'm worried. It just, for me, makes me nervous. And so I want to protect. I want to do those things. The other side of this we have to think about is like Jesus. There are times in our lives where all we want to do is go and go and go. And Jesus tells us, wait. Just wait. And we don't always understand why he says wait. Right? Because humanistically, it feels weird for us in 2020, right? Why has the pandemic, why has the quarantine stuff been so hard for us as a people group? Because we are so used in our society to being able to go wherever we want, whenever we want, however we want. And a lot of these shutdowns have forced us to do what? Stay at home. Look at the walls around us. And those walls close in. And I'm not saying it's easy, and I'm not saying I've always agreed with it. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is, is there are moments in our lives where Jesus tells us we've got to wait. And part of the reason we have to wait is, one, because he may be protecting us from something. The other side of that is, it's just a trust issue. Are we willing to trust Jesus enough that when he says wait, we would wait? Now, I don't know about you, church, but I struggle with that. I struggle with waiting. It's hard for me. Anybody agree? Yeah, right? The, we're the I want it now generation. Right? When the line of Whataburger is around the building, what do you do? You go somewhere else. Right? We have talked about this before. When you want popcorn, you put it in the microwave. You don't hold. How many of you have old school, still old school microwave, like old school popcorn on the stove? Yeah? Dylan even? Shell, I'm coming to y'all's house. Like, I'm going to see this. Right? No, we're the, we're the we want it now generation. Waiting is a struggle for us. And I think what we see right now with what's going on in our country, what's going on in our world, that's part of the big issue for us. We struggle with waiting. We struggle with it. There is a sweetness in waiting and trusting that Jesus is doing something. Having the ability to stand back and say, God, I don't know what you're doing, but you're doing something. And I'm excited to see what happens with it. That's what I've said from the beginning of what we've been going on with this whole COVID thing and everything else. I don't know what God's doing, but I know he's doing something. And I know at the end of the day, it'll be amazing. Because if nothing else, at the end of the day, if Jesus comes back, heaven. Right? We've read the back of the book. No matter what happens, God wins. I don't have to sweat everything else. I just have to wait and trust. And so we look at this. We're looking at a trust issue here. And so he has her wait and, and to protect her and all these other things. So we see in 14. So she lay down at his feet until morning, but it got up, but got up while it was still dark. Then Boaz said, don't let it be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. And he told Ruth, bring the shawl that you're wearing and hold it out. And when she held it out, he, sho he shoveled six measures of barley into her shawl. And she went into the city. And so this idea of another measure, this is another six Days worth of food he's put into her shawl and she's carrying it home. So he's got her set up for close to a month at this point, food wise. So she's pretty well set for for basically until what's going to happen with the Goel happens, right? Either he's going to redeem her or this other person's going to redeem her. But until that happens, she doesn't have to worry about food. And you think about that for us as a, as a people group today. That's important to us. Right? Because some of you have maybe been in that situation where you open the fridge and it's not that situation of, I don't like what's in the fridge. It's just in that situation of, I just can't eat the light bulb in the fridge because that's all that's left in there. Right? The idea of not having, not having food at all. Not the premise of, I just don't have food I don't want to eat. But the premise of, there is literally no food in the house. Nothing else matters at that point if there's not food. Right? It doesn't matter 
the bills, nothing else matters if you can't get food in your body. And so Boaz, if nothing else, has met that physical need that she's not going to have to worry about that. So then we get to 16, and it says this. She went to her mother-in-law, Naomi, who asked her, How did it go, my daughter? And then Ruth told her everything the man had done for her, and she said, He gave me these six measures of barley because he said, Don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Wait, my daughter, she said, until you find out how things go, for he won't rest until he resolves this today. And I love that end of 18. When we think about that for a minute, for some of us, when we talk about waiting and how important it is to wait well, but there's the other side of that, that when it's time for action, when it's time to move, don't hesitate. Right? We see here with Boaz, what's he doing? She says he's going to resolve this today. Where there's sometimes, we don't like to wait, but sometimes we get ourselves in this false sense where we end up waiting too long. Don't fear getting after it. Don't fear the work. When something needs to be done, do it quickly. Well, how does that work? How do we do that, church? Well, what do we do is we get in tune with what God's calling us to do. We live our relationship with Him daily so that we understand when God's saying, wait and when God's saying move. And we do that by spending time with him daily, by studying the scriptures, by leaning on one another. We learn and glean the information from, this script, from these scriptures and from God that we know when he's saying yes and when he's saying no. That we get to understand that. We do that with a daily relationship, church. We can't get to that point if all we do is pick up the scriptures when life is hard. We can't do that if all we do is pray when things are difficult. We have to do this thing daily in the same way as I look at my relationship with my wife. If I only think about my relationship with her when things are bad, that relationship's not going to go well. We have to daily work on that relationship. We have to daily spend time talking to one another, learning, hearing the problems and issues with one another. One of the things I appreciate about my relationship with my wife more than anything else is at this point in our, in our relationship, when I'm struggling or hurting, it's almost to the point now I don't have to say anything. She can walk in and look at me and go, what's your problem? What happened? What's going on? And she knows well enough if I'm not being totally honest with her about it. If I just try to hem and haw, because I know she's got her own stuff. She's got her own problems. If I try to do the, the typical human thing, which is, oh, I'm fine. Don't worry about it. Right? The thing we're all guilty of. Right? You're out in the car before church just... Yelling and screaming at each other, and as soon as you hit the door of church, what is it? Hey, how's everybody doing? Everything's great. While you're looking at the person next to you, going, "You just wait till we get up." <laughs> if we're not careful, we'll fall into that same type of situation in our relationship with God. And that's not what we need, church. What we need is to have a deep, daily, meaningful relationship with Him. So that we understand when he is saying, hold on, breathe, give this a minute. And when he is saying, it is time to move and work. And Boaz knows that the job needs to be done. And he's going to fix it. He's going to work on it that day. In the same way for us, church, there are going to be times where it may not be easy. And we may not get the answer we want. But the work has to happen. Boaz here wants to redeem Ruth. He wants to make Ruth his wife. He wants to take care of her. But he's already said it. If this other redeemer who has the right to it wants it, then that's good. He's okay with getting the answer he doesn't want. And the same thing for us today, church. We have to be okay with getting the answer we don't want. Because we have to trust that God knows better than us. In the same way as a child has to understand that a parent knows better, right? You think about it growing up. You think about that thing you wanted or you wanted to do as a child where your parent would say, mm, not a smart idea. And you just thought, oh, well, they're just mean and don't want me to have fun. But then as you got older, you realized, maybe they knew what they were talking about. Maybe they understood a little more than I thought. In the same way here, there are going to be moments in our lives as Christ followers where God says, not a good idea. Hold off on that. We have to trust. And so my challenge to us today, church, is twofold. Number one, if you have not yet begun a relationship with Jesus Christ, that is absolutely step one. As you saw with Jaron this morning, he 
made that known publicly. He has accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He has pledged to living his life to seeking out after Jesus. And what he did today was an outward reflection of an inward change in his life. And if you saw his, saw his visible testimony today or you heard words in here that help you more to understand that you need Jesus, in a few moments I'll encourage you to come up here and let me know and we can talk through that and pray together and help you begin that relationship and take those first steps. Maybe you're here today and you're just struggling with trust. You're struggling with weight and all those things that are difficult or inaction, whatever it is. I challenge you either pray where you're at and turn it over to God or come here and let's pray together and begin working those things out together. My challenge to you, church, is that you would just do what God's calling you to do. Whatever God's pulling on your heart, be open and attentive to what he's doing. With that in mind, let us pray. God, we just thank you for today. We thank you for the example set forth in Ruth. Both in what Ruth did and, and how Boaz is working, God, we just pray that we would glean the information you want us to glean from that for trust, for knowing when to wait, God, but also knowing when to move. To not hesitate when there's time for action. God, we know the only way we do that is by being close to you. By studying your word, by praying and, and seeking a close relationship with you, God. So I pray that all that are here today would do that. that. Those that haven't yet accepted you for the first time, that you would weigh heavy on their heart. Maybe today they would make that acceptance. God, for those that are Christ followers and find themselves struggling... Because that relationship isn't as close as it needs to be. Maybe today they would re reignite that fire and commit to doing the daily work necessary to build that relationship. God, we thank you that you loved us enough to offer your son, Jesus, for that relationship. That you loved us enough to redeem us, even though we didn't deserve it. And so in the name of Jesus we pray. You'll stand with us, church. Thank you so much for joining us on YouTube this week. We appreciate you doing that. Remember, if you're in the Lytle or San Antonio area, we'd love to have you join us in person Sundays at 11 a.m. If nothing else, remember we love you. There's nothing you can do about that. We hope to see you in person soon. Until then, stay safe.